Hey, good morning, friends and families of Fountain Gate Fellowship. Just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas this morning. What you're about to see was actually recorded last night for our candlelight service. So we just wanted to give you something this morning to bless you. Feel free to watch all the way through this and don't forget, have a great Christmas. Come on, is anybody excited that it is Christmas Eve? Do you feel the anticipation to be able to celebrate the, the day of our Savior's birth? Come on, we just gotta make some noise for Jesus in this place tonight. Lord, we just thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for Christmas Eve. We thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. So tonight, as we worship you and as we honor you, I just pray that we would be reminded that you're not some God that's far away from us, but that you are right here with us today. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we bless you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that I pray. Amen.
Can we just lift up a shout of praise to the Lord? Come on, one last time. Let's just sing that first verse out again. Joy to the world. And joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. And let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. Come on, can you just give him praise one more time tonight?
injured, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. The dawn of salvation beginning to break. I love thee, Lord Jesus, so gift from above. The King of the heavens forever. to me about Christmas is our Christmas carols, which everybody sings, believers and unbelievers alike, right? But what's amazing about Christmas carols is there's so much theology in Christmas carols. Emmanuel, we sing about God coming in flesh. All of the things about Christ coming as king, it's all there. Every significant Christmas carol that we've ever sung, what does it do? It brings praise and it brings glory to the Father. Isn't it awesome that even the world not knowing it during Christmas season, come on somebody, they're lifting up the name of Jesus. They're bringing glory to the name of Jesus. Come on, y'all. Come on. How many of you know that Jesus was born to die. Yeah, I, I, I thought about the passage. It's the Christmas narrative, but we're in Luke chapter 2. And you get to verse 34, and it's interesting. You got these two old prophets, one a man named Sim, Simeon, and, the, and then another named Anna, who was a prophetess, who had waited in the temple for years and had prayed for the coming of the Messiah. And finally, it happened. So here's Jesus being presented at the table in Luke chapter 2, verse 34. It says, And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Listen to what it says in verse 35. And a sword will pierce even your own soul. I mean, you know, that's a hard word to hear. <laughs> Some prophetic words are just hard to hear. This one had to have been tough for Mary to hear from Simeon. Even a sword will pierce. What was he saying? Prophetically, he was saying 
as that sword pierced the side of Jesus. In fact, that sword in the same way was going to pierce the soul of Mary. Are y'all out there? Spear, sword, right? To the end, verse 35, that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple. There's, there's your original 24-7, uh, 365 prayer uh, ministry, right, folks? There's your original IHOP, right? Golly, so incredible. Never left the temple serving day and night with fastings and prayers. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God because she knew, she knew this was the Messiah and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. On this incredible Christmas Eve night, this holy night, we're going to receive communion together as a family. This is a covenant meal. Jesus was born to die. You can't celebrate his birth without knowing, in fact, that he came to die on our behalf. Aren't you glad that, di that Jesus died on your behalf? That he shed his blood that you might be saved and set free and delivered. And that he rose again. Hallelujah. And that now his Holy Spirit fills us. What is this? This communion meal is that remembrance of what he did on our behalf. Even though we're celebrating his birth, we're also celebrating his death. Because we know at his death, salvation was brought to mankind. So can I pray over this bread and cup? This is an open communion. If you're a guest, if you know the Lord, you're welcome to receive with us. You'll be handed a piece of bread, and it'll be said to you that this is the body of Christ broken, and then you'll take the bread and dip it in the cup. And he said, this is his blood shed for you. So can I pray for you, and then we're going to receive. We have two stations in the back and three up here. You're welcome to come as a family of God together as a family receiving this covenant meal together, praising Him and thanking Him and giving Him glory that because of what Christ has done, come on somebody, we are in covenant with our Heavenly Father. We're in covenant with Him. So let me pray over this bread and cup. So Father, I want to thank You for the shedding of Your blood, for the breaking of Your body on our behalf. I want to thank You that You came God in flesh, Emmanuel, you were born to die. And God, we receive this cup today aware of all that you've done. We take nothing for granted tonight as we celebrate your birth. And we want to just say from the bottom of our hearts, we come. Come on, let's do this tonight. Let's come. Watch what God will do if we'll come with a spirit of gratitude. As we've been caught up in a lot this Christmas season and shopping and all the hustle and bustle, we're, we're, we're just stopping in this moment to say, you know what, it's all about you, Jesus. We come with grateful hearts. We come with hearts of faith. We come as covenant children of God, fully expecting you to meet us in this place. This is not some ritual dead religious motion we're going through right now. This has life in it. And let us receive of the life as we receive the bread and cup in Jesus' name. Y'all say amen. Won't you come and join us for communion?
Good evening, church, in person and online, and visitors, welcome to Fountain Gate Fellowship. Thanks for being with us at our Christmas Eve candlelight service. We're really glad that you're here. Just a couple of quick reminders. There will be no service here at the building tomorrow morning. So enjoy your Christmas Sabbath with friends and family, and then make some memories since Christmas only falls on a Sunday every few years. Then get ready for our New Year's weekend schedule. Next Saturday night kicks off with the Celebrate Recovery New Year's Eve party starting at 8.30, and you guessed it, it's going to go all the way till next year. There's going to be food, prizes, testimonies, dancing, and a few pinatas, and even two big screen TVs that we're going to be giving away. So don't miss out. The entire church is invited. It's a safe New Year's Eve alternative. Then on Sunday morning, New Year's Day, we will have an all-campus Vision Sunday luncheon beginning at 11 a.m. That's right. Not 10, but 11 a.m. next Sunday. Fountain Gate's going to provide the main dish. So bring a friend and your favorite side dish to kick off the new year with food and fellowship. Plus, you'll hear from Pastor Scott and Pastor Dennis from our Clyde campus about the great things to look forward to at both of our campuses throughout 2023. We're not changing times for every Sunday, but just remember, 11 a.m. on New Year's Day next weekend. You don't want to miss it. Now, on this awesome Christmas Eve, celebrate with your senior pastor as he makes his way to the platform. Welcome, Pastor Scott Beard. Y'all know the routine. Stand back up. Grab your Bibles. Let me pray over the Word. Amen. So, Jesus, thank you today for your Word. Thank you, Father, for just the revelation of your goodness toward us. Lord, that your Word truly nourishes our soul, that it fills us, that it completes us, that your Word was made flesh in Christ. You're Emmanuel, God, with us today. Lord, let your word speak true to our hearts. Let it change us. Let it transform us, we pray in Jesus' name. Can y'all say amen? You can be seated. Turn, turn to the Christmas narrative. Go to Luke chapter 1 with me, Luke chapter 1. And, and we're going to go up to verse 39. I'm going to read ahead first because I just can't help but read this passage because I think it's one of the most fascinating passages as part of the Christmas narrative as is in the word. Luke chapter 1, verse 39, says, Now at the time Mary arose and went in a hurry to the hill country to a city of Judah, verse 40. We're in Luke chapter 1 now, verse 40. And entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Now look at verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt or leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's just incredible. The baby, who was the baby in Elizabeth's womb? John the Baptist. This baby leapt when Mary walked into the room bearing Jesus. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Verse 42, and she cried out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how is it, how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. You know, one of the things that strikes me as you read the Christmas narrative is these are, come on, these are people with flesh and blood on just like you and I right? But it strikes me, here's Elizabeth prophetically already knowing, even before Jesus is born, while Jesus was in vitro, she already knew, she already knew that the Savior of the world was being carried by Mary. You know, as I read this, I'm thinking, would that we as believers be as prophetic, as on point, come on, and as discerning as what we see in the Christmas narrative? That we wouldn't be so caught up in our lives and in our business and in our struggles or in our problems that we miss the manifestation of Jesus. That we miss somehow the manifestation of his peace or the manifestation of his presence or power or desire to heal or whatever it might be. Man, that we would be as discerning as these. When you read this, 
Come on, if there was ever a scriptural case against abortion, this is it, right? It's this passage. John the Baptist, within the womb of his mother, leapt within his mother's womb just by being near Jesus as they both carried these babies. You know, I had, as I shared with some of you, uh, we were canvassing when we were working on the Sanctuary City for the Unborn Ordinance, and I came, a, I came up on a house. Uh, the gentleman answered the door, and I told this story. I'll tell it briefly again. And his hair was kind of going crazy and kind of had this wild look in his eye, and I thought, this guy looks like a college professor. That was my first thought. And I asked him who he was. Turns out he was a college professor at McMurray, a professor of ethics. I don't know why that made me think. I think it was his hair that made me think he was a college professor. I don't know what it was. And I started talking about, man, sir, we'd love to have yours. Well, I'm not about to support this ordinance. You are a, you're going to have blood on your hands. And he began to curse me. And I said, please explain to me how I'm going to have blood on my hands. You're denying women health care. And if you do that, they're going to die in the streets. And he just goes in this whole thing. And I said, let me just kind of turn that around because I don't want to get argumentative with you. But let me just submit to you that really the blood is on your hands. Because if you believe that it's okay to abort a baby, then the blood is on your hands. He said, no, 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 no. He said, because that baby is not a baby until it's born. It's just a lump of flesh. That's all it is. You see that acorn on the ground? That's just a seed. That's not an oak tree. That's just an That's all that. I'm like, well, sir, it will become an oak tree if you plant it. If a baby's been planted an egg in the womb and it's been fertilized, that's a baby. That's a human being. To me, this so makes the point. <laughs> Come on. We all know that, right? That within the womb, life begins at conception. But really, even before that, Psalm 139, the Father says, I, I, I knew you even before you were formed, even before you were conceived in your mother's womb. I just couldn't resist this passage because what we saw happened here this year in 2022 and the passing of this ordinance was nothing short of a miracle in our city. I still just, to this day, I just get giddy. <laughs> Somebody called me and said, Pastor Scott, there's still a sign over on Treadway. You need to go get this sign. You know, y'all probably saw it. I kept forgetting to go get it. And, and I went over finally and I picked this sign up. And as I was loading that sign in my truck, I just said, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Abilene, Texas, is a sanctuary city for the unborn. Thank you for that. Come on, let's give him praise. When you think of this passage and think about it, 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 it isn't the only powerful truth from this passage. It, it's the revelation that Mary was carrying. Elizabeth had this revelation. Mary obviously knew she was carrying the Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit within her womb. Now, let's go back a few verses to verse 30. Look at verse 30 of Luke 1. You all with me? The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be I, I, since I'm, I'm a virgin? I, I, I mean, no, that's a good question. Right? Now, how's this going to happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit, now watch this, will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, if you mark your Bibles up, I'd encourage you to underline that word, overshadow. Will overshadow you, and for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing, come on somebody, for nothing will be impossible with God. Can we say that together? Come on. For nothing will be impossible with God. Say it again. Didn't your spirit? Say it again. For nothing will be impossible with God. Look at this word overshadow. It says the word means, very simply, to cast a shadow over 
or to envelop. The, the cloud which overshadowed, we know this happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. Look at Matthew 17, verse 5. If, you, if, you don't, if you're not going there, let me read it, but write the verse down. Look at it later. While he was still speaking, a bright, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. The cloud was what? The very glory, the very presence, the manifestation of God himself overshadowed Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember the, the cloud that overshadowed the temple in Exodus 40, verse 30, when it was fulfilled with God's and filled with God's glory. Look at for, uh, Exodus 40, verse 35. Exodus 40, 35, Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled that tabernacle. Then we see it again, the same word, Luke 1, 35, the description of the mystery of the virginal conception when the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. Bill Johnson put it this way. I thought this was so good. He said, so the Holy Spirit overshadowed and came upon Mary, both in the natural and in the spiritual, and revealed Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes upon the written Word, and what happens? And Jesus is revealed. The Holy Spirit comes upon, watch this, surrendered believers. Guess what happens? And Jesus is revealed. Yeah, I don't want to in any way lessen the significance of the role that Mary played. She's called by the Lord, highly favored of the Lord. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. However, watch this. This is important that you hear this. The miracle of Jesus being manifest in and through you and me is the same miracle that happened to Mary. I'm glad you all are excited about that. I just feel excitement oozing out of you. Think about that. Oh, now, Pastor Scott, you're kind of getting overboard there. You're saying the same things happening to me that happened to Mary. The same Holy Spirit that overshadows, come on, a committed believer, a committed disciple, a surrendered believer, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to be revealed through you. The same miracle. You see, it's the Spirit of God coming upon the natural to manifest the eternal. Let me say that again because I don't think you all were listening. It's the Spirit of God coming on the natural to do what? To manifest the eternal. You can just take that box of Kleenex with you. You want to, sweetheart? Good deal. No, you're good. It's all good. Awesome. Come on. Stay with me. Let, let's kind of go back. Let's look at some of the main reasons. Why, you know, have you ever had the thought, why, why Mary? What was it about Mary that God just loved and decided to pick her? Because there were... I'm sure a lot of others that could have been candidates, but Mary. I think there's three clues. The first is this. Take a look at the word favored found in Luke 1 verse 30. The angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. How many of you want to find favor with God? Mary had positioned herself to find favor with God, to be in favor with God. I love these. I'm going to go kind of super quick. This is lightning round scripture right here, so y'all stay with me. Write, write these scripture verses down because they're super good. How can we as believers find favor? What, what, what does it look like for those of us that are surrender believers to walk in favor? Here we go, Proverbs 12, 2. We can obtain, y'all say obtain, favor. A good man will obtain favor from the Lord, but he will condemn a man who devises evil. Second, he will be encompassed, stay encompassed by favor. Psalm 5, 2, for it's you who blesses the righteous man. O Lord, you surround him with, with favor as with a shield. We are strengthened, say strengthened, by favor. Psalm 30, verse 7, O Lord, by your favor you've made my, my mountain to stand strong. For we are victorious through favor. Say victorious. Psalm 44, verse 3, for by their own sword they did not possess the land, for, and their, all, their own arm did not save them. But your right hand 
and your arm in the light of your presence, for you favored them. Five, you preserved them through favor. Say preserved. Job 10, 12, you have granted me and righteousness and loving kindness, and your care has preserved my spirit. Your favor has preserved my spirit. We are exalted in favor. Say exalted. Psalm, one, Psalm 89, verse 17, for you are the glory of their strength, and by your favor our horn is exalted. Mary found favor with God. You know what? When we walk circumspect before the Lord, when we walk in obedience to God, come on, we'll walk in favor. We'll find favor with God. I'm declaring over you, and I prophesy over every one of you, we're going to walk in God's favor in 2023. This church is going to walk in God's favor in 2023. Do you receive that? Second thing about Mary is this. No doubt another reason for God's choice of Mary was her humility. Say humility. She had favor. Say favor. She had humility. I've quoted this from Gail Irwin's book, The Jesus Style, because it's just such a good book, and I, I have to quote it again. He very powerfully kind of illustrates the kind of humble beginnings and surroundings that the Son of God was born in. Mary was the very object, really, of that humility when you think about it. He says this in his book, What an unlikely place for a king to be born. After a difficult journey for a woman in the ninth month of pregnancy, a stable is the last place that a caring husband would want her to be. The nativity scenes that decorate the landscape during the Christmas season are something less than accurate. None of them smell quite right. (laughs) We don't fully understand the unsanitary conditions of having to walk carefully around the droppings of animals and then lay a newborn baby fresh from the pains of delivery in a feeding trough, streaked with the saliva of animals. What a humble beginning. But there was humility there. Can I tell you, you get the attention of God when you walk in His favor and when you walk in humility. The third thing is this, perhaps the most endearing quality within Mary that attracted God to her was her faith slash obedience. Amen? Verse 38, Mary said of Luke 1, Behold the bond slave of the Lord after this announcement, not knowing how it was going to work. She was a virgin. I'm sure her mind was racing. What would this look like? What am I about to get into? But God, you've chosen me. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to have faith in you. Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. There was no backup. There was no questioning. There was, I'm sure, some fear, but she just said yes to him. I don't even know it's important that we say yes to him. I'm so, I I so admire this just kind of no fear in Mary to say yes to something that she knew was going to be tough. Gail Irwin, another quote in relationship to this, says, while we believe in the virgin birth now, think about the time of Jesus' birth. There weren't many commentaries written on the topic. Jesus grew up amidst whispers of the bastard and the stigma of having been conceived out of wedlock. What if the choice young girl of an outstanding church youth group suddenly appeared pregnant? Nothing about her life would indicate that such would ever happen, so everyone is shocked. With great hesitation and embarrassment, the leader of the group finally gets up enough courage to ask her who the Father is. And she responds, the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the church would laugh her to scorn? Come on, y'all. Can can we just be real and be honest? That's what Mary faced. That's what she was up against. This, let me say it this way. This was the consequence of Mary's yes. Can I tell you there's a consequence for saying yes to him? But it's a good consequence. (laughs) <laughs> but nonetheless, it's a consequence. When you say yes to him, when you, in faith, say, you know what, I'm going to do it, you lay your life down. I'm going to tell you, May 1st, 2022, upon the announcement that Lubbock could pass the Sanctuary City for the Unborn, unborn Ordinance, I was sitting in Chuck Farina's church, And in that moment, I heard the Lord say, I want this in Abilene. And I knew, I knew (laughs) there was going to be a consequence for what would lie ahead. 
And a year and a half later, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, and you guys were right there alongside me, my precious wife, and so many of you right there through the whole process. Had I been able to look ahead a year and a half of what that might have been, I probably would have said no. But there was a consequence for my yes. That's just one illustration. Can I tell you, there's a consequence for your yes when you say yes to Jesus. When you decide to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Your life doesn't all of a sudden become peachy and rosy and no problems happen ever again. Come on, somebody. Usually when you say yes to him, that's when problems begin. (laughs) Because enemy territory had been taken back. Because the enemy tried to steal you from God. He robs, he kills, steals, and destroys. And the moment he realizes he doesn't have you anymore, Kimberly Bewley, come on, child of God, he kind of he kind of upset about that. There's a consequence for your yes. Certainly Mary understood that. Mary became of no reputation for the sake of obedience and faith. I've made the mistake one time as a long story, but I made the mistake of saying something because I was upset over something that was happening in my family and and I said, God, you know, I, I don't deserve this. I have a reputation in this city, and this just doesn't look good. And I was just kind of saying this to God. And he reminded me of that verse. He said, son, you're to be of no reputation. I've not called you to Abilene to have a reputation. There's a consequence for your yes. You trust me. You trust me. You trust me with your family. You trust me with your marriage. You trust me with your finances. You trust me with your health. You trust me, and you lay your life down for the sake of the gospel. Can you say amen? This kind of brings me to the close a little bit of where I want to go tonight, this Christmas Eve service. Just a, a few moments, as we look back at Bill Johnson's observation, I want to unpack it just a little more. We could draw a powerful parallel between certainly Mary's pregnancy by the Holy Spirit and how that as believers we're filled with the same Holy Spirit who's conceived purpose and destiny in us. Without getting weird, are you thinking weird? When we say yes to Him, we are impregnated with the Holy Spirit with purpose and destiny. Is that okay to say that? You guys out there, you good? See, the the Mary miracle starts with the living God ready to work through something of His releasing grace and continues with His finding someone willing to become an instrument of that grace. That's the question. Will we be that instrument of God's grace? Are we willing? What happened in the willingness of God to accept temporary housing in a womb in order to bring eternal promise into the world is, of course, the theme of Christmas. Think about that. God himself limited himself to a womb, to flesh and blood, You see, in Mary, he demonstrated his readiness. Come on, I want you to hear this. I'm I'm not going to go much longer. Famous last words. He demonstrated his readiness. I'm letting you guys off tomorrow, okay? So y'all relax. He demonstrated his readiness. Catch this. You've got to hear this. In Mary, he demonstrated his readiness and willingness to work through an imperfect human vessel. And he is still unashamed to do the same through us. Yeehaw! (laughs) That's so good. That's so good. As amazing as, as is God's will to come from heaven to earth, and even more transcending grace is manifest in His choice to reveal Himself through the fabric and framework of humankind. What happened to Mary? God's redemptive purpose or promise was brought to her to grow in her, to be delivered through her, to change the world around her. In the same way, this is as true of each of us. God's redemptive purpose in many ways is is as much at work within us as it was within Mary. Did you know just in the last month, three of our pastor's wives, including my wife, I believe... Uh, Mia had the dream also, and then I think uh, Stephanie had a dream. They all three dreamed independently of each other that they were all three pregnant. Thank God that was just a dream. (laughs) Kim's really like, thank God that was just a dream. 
But I think it's highly significant. I'm going to come back to this even next week. But I think it's highly significant that three of our pastor's wives had dreams about being pregnant. I think there's something that God is saying to us. You know, I'll hear that again, hear this in the right spirit. We've each had an impregnating moment when the Holy Spirit's come upon us and He's birthed something of destiny and purpose. In that moment, we can remember that, that, uh, that defining moment in our life when something happens, significant power. I can, I can tell you stories throughout my life from when I was in junior high all the way up, really even younger than junior high, all the way up through now that have been defining moments when I know the Holy Spirit overshadowed me and he impregnated me with purpose and destiny and vision. And I believe prophetically that these ladies saw that again. I believe God is wanting to impregnate this church with something new. I believe there's, and I'm going to get more into it. I'm not going to jump ahead of myself. This is next week. But I believe we're going to birth something in 2023. And I do believe. I, I, believe, it, I believe it's going to be a nine-month thing. I believe there's going to be some morning sickness. I believe there's going to be some travail at birth. I don't think it's going to come easy. I'm hoping maybe for an epidural and it'll come easy. That's what happened with Kim. I mean, but I feel like the Lord's saying, no, we're going to have to push. I, I, was, I was in the delivery room for all five of our children. And, you know, we went through the Lamaz class, pick a point on the wall, focus, you know, all that whole thing. And you just throw that out the door when you get into the room. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, honey, get a, get a focus point, get a focus push. It's like, you need to get out of my way before I hurt you. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of what happens in delivery rooms. But I do believe that God is saying to us to prepare for something coming this year. And I don't know, just in my spirit, prophetically, I think it's going to come in the ninth month of 2023. It's going to be significant. There's going to be a building up to what God's going to do in Fountain Gate. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm excited about my prophetic word for us next week. Come on, y'all out there. God is good. God's choice to use Mary, a mere human vessel through which to unfold his wonder working toward mankind, discloses an incredible fact. And here it is. He revealed his willingness to bring his promises to nest in fallen human vessels. If they will only open to such grace, he is ready to change their world through them to see and grasp this as the pave the way for the merry miracle to overcome us, to occur really through us over and over again. Verse 27, Colossians 1 says, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, that's us, which is Christ in you, the hope, the hope, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor. Push. Get a focal point. Get a focal point. Fix your eyes on Jesus. There's your focal point. Focus on Him. Push through the pain. Push through the travail. Give birth to what it is that God wants to do through you. Push. About 1998, seven. <laughs> I just had this memory. We were at a meeting when all the leaders from the Toronto Revival were in Dallas. Some of you remember the Toronto Revival, the Laughing Revival, all kinds of things happened. It swept the world, it, it swept Abilene, it affected me. It's so funny I'm seeing this right now. I was on the floor. I'm a Baptist kid. I don't do this stuff. <laughs> I was on the floor with 5,000 people 
all around me. And I was doubled up and I was pushing and screaming like I was in labor. I'll never forget it. I thought, I'm losing my mind right now. There are people around me thinking that I'm losing my mind right now, but I really don't care. I felt like I was giving birth to something. I'm telling you, that was prophetic of what I think God is going to do in 2023. It was a prophetic picture of what he was going to do right here in this house and in my own life personally. And in all of you that just say, I'm a willing, surrendered believer that's saying yes to you, overshadow me, Holy Spirit, just like you did, Mary. Come on, just lift your hands to heaven as we close this service. Father, whew, man, I feel him here in this place. Your presence is here, God. Would you overshadow us? Come on, just ask the Holy Spirit to fall on you, to impregnate you with purpose. If you've lost purpose, if you've, if you've been in depression, if you've been in anxiety and fear, He can in a moment overshadow that and sweep that away out of your heart and your minds. Whew. Come on, come on, He's here. Just receive that overshadowing of the presence of God. I thank you for what you're going to bring to birth through us, through this house, and in, on a much grander scale through the body of Christ throughout the world. God, there's something coming. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. Would you just tell him you love him tonight? Thank you for the Mary miracle. Ah, oh, wow. Thank you for the Mary miracle tonight. Let it happen in this place. Just with your heads bowed, you can lower your hands. I'm just going to ask you one question. If you're here tonight, you'd say, Pastor, I... I, I've never given my heart to Jesus. I'm going to ask him to come into my heart and I want to give my life to him tonight. What better time to do it than on Christmas Eve? Maybe you know a lot about God. You heard a lot, but there's a lot of doubt in your heart. And you just say, I, I, just, I just need to get right with God. I, I want to give my heart to Jesus. Is that anybody at all with heads bowed across the room? I won't embarrass you, but just raise your hand real high and just say, you know what, I... I need to give my heart to Christ today. Thank you, bud. One else. Anyone else? I'd want to miss you. Thank you, dear. I see you. Thank you to my left. Thank you. Would you, together with me just now, especially those that raised your hand, would you pray this very simple prayer with me? Pray this out loud. Say, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, for shedding your blood, giving your life so I might have life. I accept you today into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I want to be your child. Thank you now that I'm born again. And I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Come on, can y'all say amen? Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are two or three of you that raised your hand tonight. It's real important you do me a favor. As soon as this service, we're going to have hot chocolate and some cookies out here, but there's an orange table back there, and there'll be someone there prepared to greet you. Uh, I think Vernetta's back there, but we want to make sure that we get a packet of information to you. It's very important we get this to you. So don't leave. Please don't leave before you get that from us, okay? All right. Would that 
Would that be good? I'd appreciate you doing that. Well, we're going to close this service with our candlelight service, our candlelight uh, moment. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, if you would grab your candles. If you have a child with you, we would rather them not hold a candle. I'm just saying. Uh, but uh, adults, if you could, let's start lighting these candles up, and we'll just kind of share. I think the picture of sharing this as one candle's lit to the next candle is very powerful, don't you all? That we share the light in us with another. Would that be a picture? Honey, could you give me one? Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you come up here with me? Yeah, really. (laughs) So cool. Awesome. I want to make sure everybody's as lit. Would you guys lead us in silent night? Silent night. Holy night. All is called. All As we sing it again, why don't we lift our candles up? Sing it again. Say amen. If you'll gently blow your candle out <laughs> so we don't spray wax, bring the lights back up, guys. I want my wife to come stand by me. We just want to declare a blessing over you as we're dismissed. Would you receive this blessing as we pray? You can give these candles out on the way out. I think there's a box you can throw them back in. But we bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless you with favor. That favor will surround you as a shield. We bless you with divine health, covering, and protection. We declare over you together, we declare over you that your marriages will be kingdom marriages and that your children will be kingdom children, that God will protect you, that his angels will be round about you. Come on, somebody, that you won't get T-boned at an intersection in Jesus' name. God's hand will be on you and protect you. I declare over you divine health. Do you receive that today? covering and protection. We declare God's love over you as we celebrate this Christmas season. And we say to you, we love you and we bless you, but he loves you eternally more than we ever could. God bless you guys. Stick around. There's hot chocolate and cookies. Thanks for coming out. Hey, and then also Kim and I do have a Christmas card to give 
to each family. So uh, if you would meet us at the back or at the front as we're in the foyer, we want to give you a Christmas card before we go. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.